Okay, we're just going to get started here in one or two minutes as soon as uh, people walk over. And Kyle, did you want to you want to uh, stand in front of my computer? I have my microphone on, and you can press the yeah, buttons to advance your slides and everything. I've just started the recording, um, so if anything needs to get cut out at some point, just make a little note and. Then video can get edited before it gets uploaded. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and I'll just remind anyone in the room. Uh, anyone interested in CTF things? We're just getting started over here, so uh, come on over to this area of the room to get a good look at the screen and hear the audio. First off, we're going to have uh, Kyle and Bethany. Yeah, first up, we're going to have Kyle and Bethany talking to us about the Solve My Bomb challenges. And just let me get my screen shared here. Uh, where is the option for that? I don't see the screen sharing. Uh, you should be able to claim it with the plus sign in the bottom left. Oh, there we go. Okay, yep. Oh, I see. You can only have one presenter at a time. All right. Yeah. But uh, uh, a whole stack of you are moderators, so you can <laughs> steal it off of each other. OK. And now, do I want to share a screen one or two? Who knows? One looks, one looks good. And let's see. Is the live stream seeing the uh, slides now? Looks yep, great. Looks good for me. Okay, I'll uh, hand it over to Kyle and Bethany. Hi, so I'm going to talk about Solve My Bomb, which is the challenges we made. Uh, and first, I'm going to talk a little bit about the lore. So, uh, Gort is an evil capybara, and he has plans to commit some crimes. Uh, and in this case, the crime is blowing up Easter Island. Uh, so as we can see here, he has been charged with several counts of murder, but that has not been confirmed. Uh, so like in different parts of the challenge, you had to like figure out who the terrorist was, then figure out what bounty was on his head, because obviously he's super valuable since he's been charged with several counts of murder. And uh, then you had to figure out where he was planning on uh, blowing up the bomb and then hack his laptop and defuse the bomb. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty much an overview. Often encoding problem. And, uh, yeah, so Huffman Coding uses this tree so that the most, the letters that appear the most often get the least number of bits. So it's like variable length coding. Um, and so this is just an example that I made with the actual message. Um, and one, one thing is there are some ambiguities. So you can like build a tree a different way. And I didn't include how to build the tree, but I did include the frequency of each letter. So. Uh, the way you had to build the tree was like in order. So this is actually right to left from how I, I build the tree. It's like a mirror. Uh, but like you had to have it decreasing, uh, like the weights decreasing from one end to another uniformly. Uh, like how it is here, like you can see 20, 18, like 16 and 17, 16, 15. Uh, so like yeah, that like helps resolve some of the ambiguities if you just make that assumption. Um, and then the way I solved it was just with this little script. Um, I used this Huffman library. And uh, what I did was I just assumed like we were building the tree in the order that it was in the frequency map. So the frequency map in the SigmaF metadata had like each letter and the number of times they occurred. And so I just like made a, a phantom string is what I called it, which is just like like 42 spaces, then six periods, then one capital E, 
then one capital G. And so I just went through the frequency map and like made a string that contained all those letters um, and coded that and just kept the tree. And then I decoded my message after running it through the FSK flow graph and uh, got that message, the decoding message, um, which is pretty close to the actual message. So you just have to do some like resolving a few ambiguities. Um, and you get, my name is Gort the Evil. I have a very important message for you. I'm a fearsome presence. I have planted a bomb at an undisclosed but important location. There's no way to stop me. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> and the flag, the flag is Gort the Evil. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my part. All right. And then we had a problem that was related to this SIGMF file that was handed to everyone. And um, the SIGMF file had two annotations in it. It had this region over here that was called a hint. And then it had this one called cat piano, just sort of as a bonus. And the background was the 20 meter ham band that I recorded at my house just on the roof. So it had a lot of other stuff in there to look at and be distracted by essentially. The real signal that you wanted to decode was the one that was actually outside the ham band over on the left over there. And if you decode the hint, this is what you hear. Let's suppose we have a picture or a pattern. Just coming through on the audio. To another location. And the only way to send it is through a small tube. For our purpose, we'll make this picture on a closely wound string. Now, oh no. Sorry. This has gone this has gone poorly. Uh, but anyway, it just says like, hey, this thing is encoded as like a bunch of lines essentially. So if you were to take that signal that's on the left and decode it as 2FSK, you get this signal with this semi-prime length. And at first, it kind of looks like a like the old SETI Arecibo message. It's got the uh, idols, and then it has some prime sequences in there. But if you rearrange the bits, you get this wanted poster that's in the bottom left. And the question was like, what was the bounty on Gort, essentially? So the answer was 198,733. Um, there was a bonus, which was like, oh, what band composed the cat piano melody? And actually, no one got this. So, you know, <laughs> Sur surprising. Uh, OK, and then the next one was, this is the classification problem. And you were given like a training data set that looked like this, and you've got uh, sort of each column is like a feature vector, and then on the right you've got this output vector y that's just binary zeros and ones, and uh, it it actually came out to the same length as the the earlier challenge, uh, uh, ten thousand three hundred and seventy nine samples, which is that same semi prime length. So, if you were able to perfectly classify the test data set, you would get this perfect solution on the right, which contained this QR code. Now, the beauty of QR codes is that you can build in a variable amount of error correction. So I built this one with a lot of error correction. And while it was not possible to build this exact thing, it was possible to use a, a variety of different classifiers to get the correct result. And I just I, I went through a couple versions of this. Uh, if you were to use the decision tree that's built into SK Learn, it's actually really good. And it gets about 99% accuracy against the real solution. This is the actual output from the decision tree version of this. So. I recommend people use decision tree when you need a simple uh, problem like this. Now it's kind of due to the way that I constructed the problem, but as a uh, as an overkill example, I also created a little neural network here with just two layers in it, where you can see it goes from the eight features to 32, and then 32 to 32, and then 32 to the one output neuron essentially. And then there's this quick little training script. And when you run it, it actually gets pretty good accuracy, 93% here. Um, I think I included a little animation of just me just running the training on my laptop. Uh, but this code, everything used to generate this, as well as all these solutions, including um, the stuff that Bethany's been talking about, is all in the Git repo that we have at the end. Um, this is projecting those eight dimensions down into two and then doing like a K nearest neighbors type approach. Um, this actually wasn't high enough accuracy to scan with your phone and get the correct solution. But 
you know, that that's part of the challenge. I wanted to make sure that you had to use something that was half decent, I guess, but you can kind of recognize that there's a QR code in there. Um, this was originally going to be our first, like, oh, hey, what's Gort's name? But I can't remember why we switched it up. Do you remember what the reason? I can't remember what it was, but we changed this to be like, oh, you know, he's lost the code to his bunker. Or this is how you get into the bunker kind of thing. And it was just a hexadecimal based Sudoku. And I think a lot of people plug this into the online solver, but it is possible to do this one by hand. I did it by hand once just to make sure. And it took me like two hours. It took me a long time, honestly, <laughs> but it was because it, it makes it a lot harder when you have the 16 digits instead of just the 10. Uh, but yeah, it, it did work out. I think it was like a nice relaxing break from all the signals challenges for people. Uh, and then I'm gonna hand it back to Bethany for the hack the laptop challenge, which only two people got besides us. Hi, so uh, Gort the Evil's laptop is the last barrier to like uh, diffusing a bomb. So uh, this is pretty much what I did to like set up the little script. So I was going to do like a binary, but then I decided that was too hard. So I made like a Python script um, that was just really like hidden. Uh, so it was like hard to tell what was going on. And uh, I remapped the opcodes in Python 3.9, and I made that my new version of Python, which was 3.82. And I just remapped like a couple of them. So like, it's not a big difference, uh, but it was enough so that a lot of like automatic solvers like wouldn't, wouldn't be able to solve it. Um, and then I also used PyInstaller, and with PyInstaller, I encrypted the PyC files with the Keith Needle, who is another evil capybara uh, and I bundled it into an executable. So, uh, yeah, that made it like pretty hard to like decompile it. And I was sort of going for like the solution of injecting like a, like some string format, like exploitation in the like password line. So this is the intended solution path. So this is a solution I had that actually worked and I just tried it last night. So. Um, I, I made everything like pretty obvious name wise. So that way it would be a little easier to like figure out what was going on. So I have this like password object, uh, and then this check password function. And then I can, I can get the, uh, the flag just by entering that little, uh, little snippet into the command line, uh, or no, not the command line, the password line in the, in the program. So uh then once you see the flag you can enter that as a password and it uh it will say you have diffused the bomb and yeah that's that's pretty much it the other the other way people went about it was like decompiling it and like disassembling the the python code and everything uh which is also cool um i just like tried to make that a little harder because that's that's how people wanted to solve it like at first uh so I wanted to, I want I did some like looking into you know like what actual semi bad software does like <laughs> to hide their code. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all we've got. Uh, I made our GitHub repo public, so uh, you can go look at our code, like both the private code used to make the challenges and the public code, which is what you guys saw like on the actual like CTF. So um, yeah, that's pretty much all we've got. Thank you. Thanks very much, Kyle, Bethany, and your friends at Aerospace. We all had a lot of fun playing around with those challenges. And I know, you know, for every hour that you spend working on a challenge, there was probably at least 10 hours behind the scenes uh, putting everything together, perfecting, etc. So uh, I appreciate very much all the challenges that everyone contributed. Um, next up, we have Danny, who's going to talk to us about the SETI challenges and I believe also NTSC. So let me go back 
and stop my screen share. I think that stopped it. And we should be able to make Danny uh, the presenter now. Let make me see. Uh, I, th I think I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, one I should. Yeah, here we go. So I guess that should be screen one. Yeah, looks good. Okay, so I'm actually going to start with the NTSC challenge because uh, that's going to help me set up the way uh, for the SETI challenge because it's actually related. And uh, with, these, with this NTSC challenge, we were given a signal and uh, from looking at it in spectrum, it was clear that it was a television signal and uh, actually the uh, Never the Same Color, which was the name of the track, uh, is a reference to NTSC as well as uh, there was something about back porch on on the description. So it's pretty clear that we that it was NTSC. And the easy part we uh, many people got was the audio track. So for the audio track, you have uh, different audio tracks, and all of them are FM modulated onto the same carrier, like way up in the video signal. What I did for that, and I think it's an easy way to do it, is FM demodulate that. Uh, into an IQ file, so I can actually show you how to do that. So this is the NTSC audio. And then this is your basic quarter to demo block. And then what I do is I want an, an IQ file because I want to open that with GQRX, but GQRX only opens uh, complex files, I believe. So not a problem, you do flow to complex, you put zeros in the imaginary part. And then you have your audio here. And uh, the easy thing about GQRX is you can uh, change the uh, demodulation mode and tune around. So uh, by doing that, you can basically uh, very quickly pick each of the audio tracks using FM mode and USB mode. Yeah, so GQRX can handle SIGMF data uh, directly, someone's pointing out. But I'm not sure if it can handle real uh, files. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Clayton knows. Yeah, I don't think so. It's, it's complex only, as far as I know. Yeah, so you need to trick it uh, and give it a complex file. So what you do is uh, you put everything on, re on the real part, and that just uh, mirrors the frequency axis. So you get uh, everything both on the right part of the spectrum and the uh, left part of the spectrum. And it was, uh, I believe, uh, four or five of the challenges. So that uh, the other three were on a video. And for the video, what I did was basically do my own NTSC kind of very crappy decoder in Python because I didn't really want to mess around with any of these uh, open source NTSC demodulators. I know there are a few of them, but uh, people have been having some issues with them. And I think they can be uh, rather finicky regarding synchronization. So I hoped by doing my own uh, demodulator, I wouldn't have these problems. And if there was something uh, strange hidden in the video track, maybe I would notice. So what I did at first was the following. Uh, the video is encoded as amplitude modulation. So basically, you need to uh, read the file and uh, then some filtering to get rid of the um, color information, which is on a subcarrier and then complex magnitude. And I didn't have this uh, polyphase hybrid river sampler, so I will actually come to this uh, back in a second. So we can drop this to our file, and then we uh, can go to Python. And then what happens is uh, I'm not so familiar with NTSC, so that was pretty cool because I uh, got to read up uh, doing this challenge. And then the question when you have a, some kind of video track is how long the lines are because the thing we're going to do in Python is uh, very easy, just lie the signal on a matrix. So you know you need to know what's the width of that matrix, otherwise your lines of the video do not uh, match up and you get garbage. But if you more or less are close to the appropriate length, uh, things start uh, to look correctly and you can fine tune by hand uh, until everything is uh, correctly lined up. So what happens is uh, what we can get on the internet is this number, which is the line frequency. This means uh, there are 50,000 whatever lines transmitted per second. So if we work out our uh, sampling frequency of the IQ file and divide, 
then we see that each line is 508 point something something samples. So that's too bad because I can make my matrix be either 508 um, samples wide or 509, but I cannot do 508.444. So the trick to solve this is uh, we can use this uh, very nice polyphase arbitrary resampler. This will do resampling for us so that instead of having these uh, 508 point something, we will have 508 exactly. And then we can lie uh, things perfectly. The, basically, the rate you have to put in here is the ratio of the 508 divided by this, uh, basically 508 point something. And I always get these backwards. So either it's uh, this thing or the inverse, you just test and whichever works. Uh, then this raises the question. So this is a perfect IQ file. There was no SDR uh, transmitting it. Uh, there was no uh, sampling rate error being uh, put in there by Clayton. So this works perfectly. If this comes from a real SDR or there is some sampling rate mismatch, we will need to go here and iterate and try to adjust by hand. But still, is is a good way, I think. Uh, if you have a long video, of course, you really need to do synchronization. But if not, uh, this works. So with that in place, what we can do is basically some simple Python code. We put things on a matrix. And the easiest thing is just we kind of reshape to put things on a matrix. And we get the two fields. So uh, you may know that NTSC, what it does is it first scans the even lines, and then it goes back and retraces, and it scans the odd lines. So you have the two fields forming an image. So the first thing, uh, which is easy, is you can get one of the fields, the first field in the video. And you see this QR code, but it's actually a recrawl. So <laughs> have fun. Uh, then the next thing we can do, uh, just because it's easy, is basically this kind of thing, which is putting together the two fields. And by putting together the two fields, we deinterleave the the NTSC video, and we get the uh, complete frame. So my thinking here is, OK, I'm doing some crappy Python code. I'm not looking at the video, just the first frame. This is video. Maybe it changes afterwards. So what I did was uh, I basically uh, dropped each of the frames to a file, uh, to a PNG file, and uh, basically went through them with uh, some uh, PNG browser. So you can see how this looks like. Uh, of course, the resolution we're using is not preserving the correct aspect ratio, but we can fix that. And uh, what I did was just to go through these. And uh, we can see uh, two things. The first of them is there are some lines here which keep changing. And this will become relevant later. But if we scroll, if we scroll through, uh, probably not going to do it right now. At some point, the QR code here changes. It's very easy to do. You can scroll really fast through the frames as if you were playing video, and you just see it uh, on the corner of your eye. I think if I do it right now, maybe the frame rate on the screen share is not uh, so good. So uh, just believe me. At some point, the QR code changed. And I think my phone is not able to read it like so. So I just open the particular PNG file and uh, change the aspect ratio with the GIMP. And then uh, we go. So that's another flag. And we are missing the two flags. And we have this weird thing. So my first thinking was, hey, these uh, things are changing with every frame. Maybe this is some other kind of image. Maybe if we stack all of them up, we uh, recompose some kind of image, you know, some way to uh, hide a message inside this area, which is uh, the vertical blanking interval, which is not visible by a regular TV. So OK, I went and tried to do that. Uh, the way it looks like is we can basically put all the lines together, and we see it's like uh, every two lines, there's something. So again, coming back to the, there are two fields, so the even and odd field. Uh, maybe we can try to separate. So this is the even field. These are all the odd fields, so each each row is, uh, so each column, sorry, is one of the video frames. But uh, what is this? I, I don't know. Maybe it looks like Space Invaders or who knows. So it's it's not an image. There is nothing here. And uh, this got me thinking, maybe some kind of digital message. Uh, of course, there's, there's no crumbling. There's no nothing. So some, some simple digital message. And then that got me thinking, maybe Teletext, mm -hmm. you know, there's this Teletext, it must be encoded somehow. And I got reading up and decided it wasn't Teletext because uh, Teletext is transmitted much faster than what I was seeing. 
but there is something else uh, besides teletext, which is the closed captions, so you know these subtitles, and these are much lower data rates. So, yeah, from what I read, uh, this seemed to match. They are transmitted in line 21 of the video. I kind of got these standard documentation online, and as you can see, the pattern matches perfectly. So we have this sinusoid, and then uh, basically a couple of characters per line. And we also learned that there are independent closed captions on field one and field two, which is kind of optional if you want to have a second closed caption channels. So basically, slice everything by hand. You have the bits, you have everything. Check the parity when oh, that's, there's a parity bit. And uh, the thing is basically ASCII code. So once we do on the field one, uh, this is what we read ASCII code, and the flag is somewhere. So here's the read roll again, but the flag is here. So here's the flag. And uh, then we go to the other field. So the other field, we see this kind of thing. And it's pretty much clear this is the flag because you know it's a kind of flag, uh, same format, same everything. But I wasn't sure what kind of encoding this was. I thought this was, this was like a, an official encoding table for closed captions because you have encoding tables for uh, Russian, for Chinese, and so on. But I couldn't uh, find anything that uh, preserved the numbers and uh, these things, but change all the letters. So at some point I said, oh, rot 13. So rotation 13, you just uh, solve rotation 13 and you get the flag. And I think those were all the flags for NTSC. And this uh, still raises the question, what can you do if you don't know the line length of the video, which we knew here, and we also knew in the uh, image challenge from the Diffuse My Bomb, which is related because it's an image. And then I want to show something uh, using autocorrelation because uh, that's what, what's needed in the SETI challenge. So let's move on to the SETI challenge. In the SETI challenge, we are basically given this file. Let me open it up. So. Uh, the format was rather awkward, sorry for that. Uh, was a way to make it smaller, 6,000 and then ATA. So something to point out is, I think it's pretty obvious, we are given two files, polarization X, polarization Y, and as it happens, the ATA is a dual polarization instrument, as mostly everything in radio astronomy. So that's how observations are conducted, I mean, but it should be relevant for the uh, CDF. Uh, so we can see this. There is a signal with some Doppler drift, which is characteristic from, um, I don't know, uh, space things, really. And we have these pulses on the signal. And you can see here there are two pulses. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit more. So two pulses, three pulses, uh, five pulses, seven, uh, 13, I believe, uh, 11, sorry, 13. So these are the prime numbers. Uh, the signal is basically... Um, plain prime numbers as amplitude shift keying. And then there is something else. So if you look at the file name, uh, this HIP91 blah, 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 which is also in the CMF data file, this is the uh, catalog code for the star Vika. So all of these challenges is intended as a reference to the uh, contact book and film which uh, is very popular within the radio astronomy community. I've heard from many people who went into the field basically because they loved the book or the film. So I have actually tried to make this challenge as close as possible to the book within uh, what makes sense for a, th for a CTF. And what happens in the, in the book is uh, the scientists basically detect an alien signal from Vega. And it's, um, it's more or less this width. So it's a couple hundred hertz wide. It's amplitude modulated and it has a prime sequence. So they say, hey, this is intelligent life. But then at some point they realize there is some hidden signal in the polarization. And uh, the hidden signal is a TV signal which is playing back the uh, Olympics from uh, the Nazi times. So yeah, everything is pointing to there is something in the polarization because that's what the book says and uh, we're given two polarizations. But now what uh, should we do? So actually, if you read the book closely, uh, it says uh, the polarization they use is circular, which is also the case here. And you can also try to think about it, because if we are playing with linear polarization, 
and we have a linear polarization receiver, then we would see polarization changes as amplitude changes. And that would be no fun for this challenge because basically you can ignore the polarization and say, well, the polarization is changing, but I see that as amplitude changes. So we use uh, circular polarization for this challenge basically because uh, you can change uh, left and right and it's not obvious on the uh, linear polarization. So uh, what we need to do is basically we need to convert this from uh, linear polarization to circular polarization. And there are a couple of ways to uh, go and do that. So for this kind of thing, it's uh, very useful to look at this Wikipedia page on stock parameters. It has all sorts of formulas related to how uh, you can have different polarizations, bases as they're called, and how you can convert from one to the other. And you can do that in Gun Radio in two ways. So let me open up the flow graph. Way number one is basically this one, uh, which actually appeared in one of the talks, but <laughs> I think there was a typo on the slide. Uh, they missed this 1j factor. So basically what you need to do is x plus 1jy, that's one of your circular channels, and then x minus 1jy is your another, uh, so left, let's say right-handed, left-handed, and then basically the signal is encoded as a power difference between uh, right-handed and left-handed because there's basically no other way it could be encoded by playing around with the polarization. So we kind of, uh, we can uh, kind of do complex to magnitude square to get the power and then subtract. This is the power difference between right and left. So that's one way to go about it. And the other way, which is uh, somewhat shorter, is uh, basically this one. So you can already obtain the uh, polarization degree or the differing uh, left versus right doing this multiply conjugate of the two channels and then taking the imaginary part. So it's exactly the same operation, just written differently, and this is nicer. And then what we can do is uh, basically we can uh, kind of see what happens if we just uh, look at the difference in polarization and uh, for the sake of uh, doing this faster, I've put in here some uh, some plots with already a low-pass filter because, as you can see, uh, there is something going up and down on the signal. So, hey, there's look, there looks to be something of interest. And uh, again, uh, the book says uh, there must be some kind of video signal. So what happens here is we basically drop the signal to a file. We can do uh, the regular signal with no uh, low-pass filtering, or we can low-pass filter. Uh, low-pass filtering helps to get rid of the noise, but even so, it works if you don't low-pass filter, and I can show that in a second. So what we do, uh, let me scroll real quick, is we do not know anything about the line length. And I'm actually going to start with the, just the polarization, no low-pass filter. And these FIR tabs, I'll explain in a second why it's there. And what we do is uh, autocorrelation of the signal. So we can do that with SciPy. And then basically we get this uh, kind of plot uh, pop up. Yeah. So every autocorrelation is very strong in the middle. That's just because the signal with no delay uh, correlates uh, perfectly with itself. What we must look, and then it's symmetric, right? Because it's autocorrelation. What do we must look is if there are any peaks here. And here we can see a peak, here we can see another peak, and maybe there are peaks close by. Uh, but think for a second. So uh, this whole length represents the whole length of the file. If we are looking for a TV signal or for an image signal, uh, SSTV signal, this has to have many lines. So it cannot be that uh, the length of the line is half of the file length or one third of the line length. It should be one of the peaks which is much closer to the center. And I've basically done a few plots where I uh, only plot half of it, then I'm zooming in, uh, missing this peak, which is, uh, you know, it's a large peak. And this looks interesting, so, and this looks interesting, so, but this is way off. So let's zoom in. Let's zoom in close to the uh, close to the center. And if we zoom in, we have this peak. So if we try to with this peak, which is stronger than the other ones, basically I'm uh, 
getting the delay corresponding to this peak. So that will give me the length of the line. And already we can see this thing when we lie our data as a matrix, just as in the NTSC challenge, using the line length that came from this correlation. So we see this uh, bar here, and the bar was put on purpose to make this thing easier. Uh, so this will uh, give you a strong correlation peak. And we can even see some text here. Uh, you know, it's um, rotated, but we can fix that. And this is actually the flag, and I believe it's already possible to read it. But anyhow, why is it rotated? Uh, because instead of NTSC and PAL and everything else, this is scanned uh, from top to bottom rather than left to right, because you know, aliens, why not? So what we can do is basically rotate this, which is a matrix transpose. We already have the flag, but we can keep working if we want and improve the image. So here we improve the contrast and the aspect ratio. So there's the flag and there's the GNU radio logo. And we also notice these patterns. These are actually the prime numbers uh, because they are amplitude modulated. They are not supposed to be a part of the um, of the image. So if you want to remove them, of course, not at all necessary. The flag is perfectly visible here. Uh, we can do that. Uh, what we can do is, let me go back real quick to the GNU radio. We can use this part of the flow graph to measure the power of the, this kind of an IGC. We need to normalize the power changes of the amplitude shift gain. So we measure the power of the signal measure the power of the um, noise. We have to adjust for the uh, group delays of all these filters to line things up correctly. Uh, this is the output of the power measurement, so we can see the pulses. And then we basically divide this, which has the amplitude variations due to the pulses, by the power we're measuring on the pulses. And we arrive at a pretty good image. So that's the challenge. There was also some interest, I think, on the OFTM challenge. Uh, so Orange Charib got that. I'm not sure if they're around. I think I can say a couple words here on chat if someone's interested. Sure, yeah, whatever you want to do. Yeah, so maybe say a couple words here. These I don't have really prepared, but I can go here. So basically, this was my attempt at doing some easy OFDM uh, custom thing. And you know, OFDM is never going to be really easy, but I tried to make it as easy as possible. So the way I did it is uh, let me first start with the, uh, with the OFDM file. Ah, here, OFDM. So uh, well, uh, Inspectrum, sorry, format, I think this was complex 16, uh, whatever. The sample rate was not really important. Uh, I think I used one of the LTE ones, but this isn't intended to be any kind of reference to LTE. And then, yeah, we can see the signal here. So if we go back, I mean, there are there are many things which you can really see already in the spectrum. And in fact, uh, Orange RF did, uh, he was showing me their solution. So basically, if you use the correct kind of scale here, you can see you can see this vertical line every time that the OFDM symbol changes. So with that and cursors, we can already measure the OFDM symbol length, and that happens with every OFDM sin signal. So this is the symbol length, including cyclic prefix, and this will come relevant uh, any way you solve it. And you can also see that there is a symbol which has a pattern, and this is obvious. It's some kind of uh, synchronization symbol or pilot symbol or whatever. Then you have one, two, three, four, five, seven, I think, data symbols. So from this uh, inspectrum already, you know uh, the structure of the signal. The thing which is missing is basically what's the number of OFDM carriers and what's the carrier separation. So the carrier separation is equal to the useful symbol. This is equal to the symbol time we have computed here minus the cyclic prefix. And then the question is what's the cyclic prefix length? But you can find that using uh, the autocorrelation. Basically, uh, the Smith-Cox uh, uh, synchronization algorithm, and it's written on my blog actually. So 
By doing that, you can find the sacred prefix duration, the useful symbol length. Sacred prefix here is one eighth of the symbol, which is a very popular uh, sacred prefix length. So again, to try to keep things easy. And uh, the symbol, useful symbol duration comes out to, you need to do an FFT of 1024 channels, which again, very popular choice. And I think uh, three quarters of the channels are occupied. That's easy. You do the FFT, you see which channels are occupied. And the rest is um, bread and butter, OFM, uh, OFTM demodulation. You take your pilot symbols. The hint here was the, uh, this synchronization sequence. So it's a 32 bit pattern which uh, keeps repeating. And this is QPSK modulation. So you at least, at least need to know something about how the synchronization sequence looks like, just in case you choose the wrong encoding for the QPSK constellation. You know, you can encode things in several possible ways. So uh, given the synchronization sequence is intended as, hey, this is the kind of QPSK encoding you should be looking at. And then the data is basically ASCII text, so that should be really obvious. There were a few other challenges uh, doing ASCII text as well. And it's basically the Wikipedia article on OFDM, <laughs> so sections and sections of the article, and somewhere there it's inserted the flag uh, in ASCII text. So basically, once you demodulate these, you can uh, grip for the flag. And that's pretty much it. Amazing. Thank you very much, Denny. Thank you. Again, I know a lot of people had a lot of fun on those, so thanks for making them. Okay, next up, we're going to have Vlad, uh, who's going to give us a demo of Shall We Play a Game? Uh, and I'm just going to mute my microphone so that Vlad can uh, unmute and talk to you from his machine. All right, Vlad's just getting himself back in the meeting here. Okay. Oh. All right, hopefully that's the right, Vlad. You should, I gave you presenter permissions. establishing audio connection. Um, there we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. All right, Vlad's just still trying to get himself connected here. Potato computers. <laughs> All right. I think, I think we got, we got it. it. Okay. Finally, start off, I guess. Uh, I go on that. Do that? Yeah. Right. Okay, can can people hear me now? Okay, awesome. Sorry, terrible old laptop. Um, <laughs> okay, I think everyone should be able to... Can people see my screen? Yes. Yes? Okay, awesome. You can't see that? Say my name. 
Oh. What is it sharing? I said entire stream. It is swiftly refusing to share my screen. Okay. How are you sharing? Okay. Now it's coming up. So I'm minimizing my window, and it's just not. Looks like it's sharing your browser window. Yeah, for even though I selected entire screen. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll do this. Can I do this? Okay, yeah, I see GQRX. Okay. Wait, what? Sorry, yep, shouldn't be. Why is it not? Okay, okay, there we go. Finally, it went through with my entire screen. It was just refusing to let me do that. Okay, um, so this is the... Uh, uh, I just forgot the challenge name. <laughs> Shall we play a game? Shall we play a game? Yeah. So the basic idea of this challenge uh, was that you had to send a, uh, a message to uh, Clayton's receiver and play the game that came back to you. So this ended up being uh, an APRS packet uh, that you had to send. Uh, with the correct format and message, which uh, ended up being my biggest point of suffering through this challenge was getting the correct uh, text string into the APRS packet because APRS, if you're not familiar, is the, one of the really ancient uh, and tragically not deprecated <laughs> amateur radio uh, data uh, transmission standards. So it's just... It's essentially FM inside FM. It's AFSK. It's FSK tones uh, at 1200 baud that get FM modulated. Uh, so that's how you send out your APRS packets. Uh, and so there's a whole standard behind it that will tell you, you know, you can beacon text or put, uh, send position reports and whatnot. So in this case, uh, the goal was to send a status message that uh, contained the text new. Uh, and this would sort of start the game. So and your screen share stopped. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. I need an Ethernet cord. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yep, there we go. So I think we're back. So. <laughs> Uh, right now, I have GQRX pulled up, um, which is showing the 900 megahertz band. Okay, I guess it's just super small. Um, so the first part of the challenge was to send the uh, actual first APRS packet, um, which the challenge said we need to send new as a status. Um, so. There's a lot of different ways you can do this. There's technically like a GNU radio module that can generate APRS, but uh, having gone through all the various methods, I found that actually the easiest way to do this was to generate a sound file using a uh, APRS modem called Direwolf. So like, an, like a bunch of the other decoders you may or may not have ho heard of for like Poxad, uh, or like other low bandwidth digital modes. Direwolf is just a sound card modem to generate uh, APRS packets. Um, so then I figured once I have, uh, once I had generated the uh, APRS packet, I could FM modulate them uh, and send them out in hack RF. So I will try to share my screen again. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, guys. I can't do anything about that. Um, so basically, this is the flow graph uh, that I ended up using to 
transmit my packets once we get there. Here we go. So I have this file source, which is going to take the WAV file that Direwolf generates, FM modulate it, uh, and send it out of the HackRF. Um, so in order to actually generate the packet, I have this string here. So we echo uh, my call sign. Uh, so this is the basic like format is my call sign is the source, the destination is just ID. Uh, and then the trick was figuring out these stupid two characters, uh, uh, the colon and the arrow, uh, in order to indicate that this was a status message. I, I just struggled with that a lot for some reason. <laughs> um, so you insert this status message into gen packets, which is part of Direwolf. So it just generates a packet as a wave file. So I can go ahead and do that, and it'll dump that out to packet2.wave. Uh, so once I have that generated, I can uh, start my flow graph, and that should transmit the packet. So you see I just have it run to completion, so it stops almost immediately. Uh, and yeah, there we go. You can see it poorly uh, here in the spectrum. So now we have to go find our response. This was supposed to be somewhere in the 900 megahertz band. Uh, so if we go to 926 megahertz, we should see. Oh, it's just delayed. Oh my gosh, it's so slow. Well, actually that's fine because I'm actually not seeing anything anyway. <laughs> did, it get, did it get the packet? Uh, I didn't receive it. You didn't receive it, okay. How about that time? Uh, yep. Oh, I think I now you get a screen share again. <laughs> All right, so he's transmitted the packet. Now we're going to see if we can get the response. Uh, there we go. Okay, so you should see that in the uh, 900 megahertz band, we now get uh, Clayton's response. I have to pick my game up, jeez. <laughs> so basically, we're going to be playing a game of Wordle in the water. So this is Sturtle, as uh, Flame Wyver called it. <laughs> okay, so let me pause this here for a second. Uh, so basically, we have six tries uh, to guess the correct word. So it was giving us a bunch of examples on how to play Wordle here. Uh, but basically, I now have to go send some APRS packets to this thing, and I'm going to get printouts on the spectrum here. Oh, my screen stopped sharing again. Oh, that's wonderful. <sighs> None of y'all know what the hell I'm talking about. <laughs> if you want to get to me, I have the like, recorded packet reception. Yeah. So you may pay the presenter. OK. Sure, we can do that. Uh, Kyle, you're the presenter now. Yeah, so basically you just got, you would send APRS packets uh, with the word that you're guessing, um, and you would get this spectrum printout of your guess, and you know, like Wordle would tell you if it was in the right place, uh, if your character existed uh, in the word at all, uh, and eventually you, so you had six tries, so if you got it within six tries, uh, you won the flag. That's basically it.
Great. All right. I'm glad uh, glad the two of you had fun with this. And if anyone else wants to try it, it's running right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Let's see. Next up, we have Don, who's going to show us some. Uh, what are you going to show us? You're going to show us the uh, Game challenges. So uh, actually, Ben was able to be here. Um, so we're going to both present. He's going to talk to how he um, sh he made them, and I'll talk to how I solved them. Can you guys hear me right? Cool. Thanks. Uh, so let me use the presenter. Firefox tab. Cool. I should be able to make that full screen. Eh, good enough. Okay, so um, yeah, so these are a series of Dune challenges um, that Ben Muadib on uh, Matrix made. Um, they're super fun. He is here, so um, he can you, uh, you want to say something about the, the overall structure of them, uh, Ben? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah, you're, you're good. Okay. So, yeah, um, you know, as you can tell by my handle, I'm you know, a big fan of the movie Dune and the, well, the story, the book, and yeah, just in general. So, wanted to do a series that was based on part of the. Um, you know, kind of just some themes from the story. Um, so the first challenge, let's do uh, I Can Kill With a Word. So I Can Kill With a Word. So it said, Fremen scouts have scavenged one of the broadcast units for long-range sensor transmission. That one's meant to mean uh, like a high-power FM. Uh, and so it is transmitting to spice-mining vessels. It's been repurposed to reach pockets of those loyal to House Atreides. The banner of House Trades and re recorded historical moments from the great hero Paul Muad'Dib are contained within, within. So the, that portion right there, the banner of House of Trades uh, should have been really obvious because the banner of House of Trades is being broadcast with uh, spectrum painting and the recorded historical moments were um, were moments uh, like audio snippets uh, from the movie. And then uh, the hidden message for those who can find it sort of implies that it's not going to be like right there, you know. So anyway, uh oh, that wasn't me. Um, so anyway, yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll take up uh, and say on the on solving this right, it was it wasn't too bad. It's just you had to to kind of guess that it was in the RDS field. So um, there's a screenshot of GKRX. You can see the, uh, the in the radio text subfield is the flag. Uh, so it was a good intro to this to this series of challenges. Um, so yeah, that was a good start. So I also the yeah, oh, basically the letters RDS. So that was. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to start talking to? Two, or do you want me to? You can go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So uh, on, the, on the next series of challenges, they, they kind of build upon one on one another. Um, you'll you'll find near the banner, you can kind of see the banner leaking over on the side of the spectrum there. Uh, this audio channel, and in the audio channel is some instructions. There are, there's so there's you're hearing uh, overhearing radio chatter from uh, what what appears to be a ground station and a and a drone of some kind. Uh, or a team that has picked up a drone, and uh, what you eventually uh, find in that that audio stream is this APRS beacon. Um, you don't know. I mean, you'll you you can decode it with uh, GNU Radio's AFSK decoder. So you do a little bit of uh, determination of the baud rate, and you can pretty easily to tell that it's that it's APRS. Um, especially since we've seen it in a few other challenges, the CTF. Um, so then, you know, you, uh, you, in GKRX, I was able to easily pop that up and, uh, there's your, your next flag. Um, so 
that's that one. Uh, do you want to say anything more before we go to the next one? I enjoyed seeing all the struggle on this one. You open GQRX, <laughs> ingest the signal, open up the AFSK decoder, there's the flag. Uh, so carrying on with the next series of challenges, the next challenge is the switching the primary slash the key, but um, it's it's kind of, uh, I know one thing Ben pointed out during the CTF is that you, uh, you're you you're watching like a real-time uh, situation play out, right? So you're supposed to be able to follow what's going on in the, in the spectrum. At one point, uh, they say they're switching to their primary communication mechanism. Um, so you, you see that this, uh, after this, your, your um, audio, uh, your FM audio turns off, you get these digitally modulated signals popping up on the left here. Uh, and if you uh, do a little bit of research on Sigin Wiki or whatever, you'll find that these are actually DMR, um, and that's another form of audio. Um, you're able to process those uh, using um, GRDSD or, or DSD. I, I pipe mine directly from um, from GQRX through uh, using this command in the middle um, to, uh, to DSD. There was a little bit of, of uh, I had to get kind of specific, limiting the DSD to only decode the certain flags that were, were, were uh, able, to, uh, the, the modulation type for this. So it was a little bit of trial and error. I eventually got clean audio out of it, and you can hear it. Um, in there, there's there's one flag uh, immediately just spoken in the audio, and then um, for the second half of this challenge, uh, the, the next and the key, uh, you when you hear the audio stream, uh, the, the challenge indicates that it is literally spoken in the audio of this challenge, so uh, you can grab the, the second one. Um, I don't know, Ben, if you want to speak to this at all, or... Guess I'll uh, I'll move on. So um, yeah, the next one here is uh, using. You'll get some indications in the audio streams that they're they're sending an encrypted message um, using the uh, the high band or the low band of this uh, this uh, digital mode. You'll eventually find. Uh, I mean, I, you, if you look at this this type of. Uh, uh, communication, you'll see. I don't have a spectrogram picture of it, but Laura is extremely dis uh, distinct. Um, I think a lot of people struggled with with the, the correct software to process it. Um, I, they tested this uh, the GR Laura SDR, which is used to generate it, can also be used to decode it. Um, there's a little bit of, of uh, playing around with the parameters, but they're they're pretty pretty common parameters uh, for the Laura. And and once you put that that those correct parameters in, you get this key uh, long lived big tube Lido out. Um, this LoRa burst was transmitted next to the, the FM carrier, so it was kind of uh, right there and obvious. If you look, if you listen to the audio, though, you'll hear that they're actually transmitting uh, the, uh, and I believe this one had the, the data, maybe the key was in the higher band. You, you'll see references to a, to a higher band LoRa transmission as well. Um, when, you, when you go to that one, you'll eventually find uh, between the two LoRa combinations, you get a, you get a blob of uh, hex, and then you get the, the, uh, the key from the previous challenge, um, and uh, it indicates that it's encrypted. So um, this moves into this next challenge. Um, on this challenge, you have to figure out how to decrypt this packet. Uh, that you got out of the two different Laura bursts. On the um, there was a bunch of trial and error. I included my uh, CyberChef uh, screenshot here where I tried a bunch of stuff. But the uh, the key being 16 bytes long was a pretty clear indication that it's that it's uh, AES. Uh, there's only a few ciphers that that had that uh, that are common, right? Um, so anyway, yeah. After a little bit of trial and error with the mode and the and the type. Uh, I was able to get out this flag for the last challenge here uh, in in this this half of the series. Um, I don't know if you have any other comments here, Ben. Ah, uh, no, not really. Okay. Um, and then this one, uh, I think if if uh, there's going to be much talking to it, it's probably going to be on this one. I. I Got a little bit of help on this one. Um, so the, this last challenge involved a really, really weak, um, seemingly QPSK signal. 
uh, you got to you could download it from the challenge site, and the um, the challenge text indicated that there it was something to do with financial, and it included uh, exact frequencies. Um, if you Google those exact frequencies, you'll uh, uh, in you know including the financial information, you'll see talk about a Blockstream satellite. Also, there was a talk about this at the conference, I believe, uh, coincidentally, uh, earlier in the week. So. Uh, it does give you a, a bit of a hint. Um, to demodulate this was a little bit more more work. Uh, I, I originally tried by hand as well, and, and the SNR is really poor. Um, but uh, you know these these more complicated modulations have a lot of error correction and stuff. And if you if you get the appropriate um, software, which you can get from from searching about this protocol. Um, you'll eventually see that uh, you can use the, the DBBS2 RX um, to, to modulate it. And uh, you'll have to install this uh, this block set client. From there, you can eventually extract using the commands I listed um, the 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 flag, which is shown at the bottom. Um, the one thing I'll say is, you know, it's always great when in solving this, right? It's always great to to search Google for things because uh, there is the, the the almost the exact commands to solve this were posted uh, by the challenge author in a GitHub issue on the project, uh, requesting an update of documentation. So, um, you know, that, that pretty much gets you right there. So uh, it's always good to, to uh, do a little bit of social examination uh, to try and solve these things as well. Um, yeah, hey, so uh, I wanted to make sure that I point out that um, with the uh, all these good, uh, the was done with hardware, so I used uh, an Anytone radio to generate the APRS. I used an Anytone radio to do the DMR. I used LoRa Heltec boards to generate the LoRa. So these are all real over-the-air signals. And on this one, it's no exception. Um, this was I, I used a Bitcoin wallet to uh, purchase uh, the the right to send this message. Um, it cost me about thirty cents, so it's okay. Um, and basically, I sent it over the Blockstream satellite network. And I recommend that you watch um, watch the uh, Blockstream satellite talk. It's the first one at GRCon this year uh, about that mechanism. But yeah, so this was sent over Galaxy 18, and I received it uh, out of my office window uh, at home with a 18-inch tailgating dish and an LMB. So um, this was also sent over real hardware, like from a real satellite, and I uh, was able to, even at low SNR, still uh, demodulate, decode, and, and pull the message out. So uh, you know, a lot of this is kind of real hardware work, and I think this is one of the challenges to the real world. So that was, uh, this was a fun one to do, definitely tricky, and some just kind of like command line stuff you need to throw in there that's uh, for the API, but uh, very powerful and I wanted to showcase it. And I was really happy that a lot of people came up to me and they had already figured out based on the clues in the, in the, uh, in the challenge that it was in fact Blockstream Satellite. So just getting to that point uh, was, was difficult. And uh, Danny, thank you so much for your effort there. It was really cool to see how you approached the problem um, uh, instead of just like me script king the thing, like actually look at it from a scientific perspective. So thank you. All right. Yeah, that's all I have for slides. So turn it back over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Ben. Those challenges were amazing. All right, and let me see. Uh, I think last up we have Bjorn Curler, who's going to show us a little bit about uh, SSTV. Yeah, <laughs> uh, can do. Just uh, all right. I just made you the picture. How... Uh... Okay, no idea. Okay, here we are. So I'm going to share the screen. And uh, I hope the resolution isn't too large for you all guys, but uh, <laughs> it uh, should be fine. So um, here we are. 
and uh, basically it's uh, just a flow graph. I hope you can see the flow graph, right? And uh, I've uh, already uploaded uh, the flow graph to uh, the chat as well. Um, so you can directly load uh, the SIGMF data uh, and uh, it's uh, just using the uh, usual SSTV chain and uh, then puts it to the audio sync uh, where you can create a loopback device and uh, then you just start uh, SSTV and uh, you just run it. Press uh, play on QSSTV and hopefully we should see the first signal coming in and uh, then you can see uh, immediately that the picture will be decoded. including the uh, QR code. The good thing about the solution is uh, you can use it in real time for like uh, getting the SSTV from uh, the ISS as well. So uh, I think uh, we don't have to wait until we see the full uh, picture, right? Yeah, I think QR code is just coming now, so. Yeah, so uh, oh. I think we're good. Yeah, we're good. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, and I'll just check uh, before we finish whether there's anybody else uh, who didn't let me know earlier. Is there anybody who has a challenge uh, solution that they'd like to show? Oh, I see a couple of people typing. Uh, signal to noise. There's a request here if anybody has a solution to signal to noise. Anybody have anything to show? I don't have anything to show. I can briefly talk to how I solved it. OK. Yeah, let us know how you did it. Um, so uh, can you mute Clayton? It's really loud. <laughs> cool, yeah, yeah, so um, I, I solved it by um, average success. By, it, it, Brute force, really. Uh, for each character, I, I tweaked. Um, uh, I used a different tool than Spectrum, but I believe we should be able to do it in Spectrum as well. Tweaked the FFT size and the averaging, uh, or the zoom, so that uh, you got uh, you know just enough of that data vis uh, visible. So it, the the image was both shrinking in in width, so you needed a higher resolution FFT to get the same bin resolution, and also um, it was stretched out in time, so you needed to average more and more of the of the data at the same time to be able to to make up the to get enough gain on the the, the view to see that that uh, that character. So trial and error, just playing around with the zoom settings, I was able to extract uh, one character at a time until I got the whole thing. And then I had to go back and fix a character. It's probably not the most scientific solution. You can probably do something a lot better in code, but uh, that that seemed to work. And I see there's a there's an image posted so. Yeah, when I when I was testing it out to make sure it was solvable, I used a combination of Inspectrum to read the first eight or nine characters, which were visible, uh, and then switched over to GQRX to read the last few, because there you have pretty fine control over the FFT resolution. You can go much higher FFT bin counts than you can in Inspectrum. And uh, also you have very fine control over the time resolution. Uh, of the uh, waterfall. So between the two tools, and uh, of course, you can also zoom in very finely on the uh, on the amplitude axis. So between the two tools, I was able to get bits and pieces of the flag and then stitch it back together. Um, all right. I think from here, we can probably move the rest of the discussion back into the CTF channel. So feel free to share even more uh, details, throw your flow graphs up, post them to GitHub. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, my, all of my challenges have the source code posted to GitHub and the aerospace folks have their solutions posted so we can drop the, we may as well drop the links in the channel uh, again. Uh, the other challenge authors may also publish some of their code in the future, in which case we'll also drop things into the channel. So uh, thanks everybody for uh, contributing challenges, for playing. Uh, I had a lot of fun and I'm looking forward to doing this again next year. I all say thank you for running this whole thing. This is super fun. Welcome. All right, Derek, if you're still there, we can turn off the recording.